It was 27 years ago that Linus posted that he was working on a free operating system, but it was really just a hobby. Hello there, my name's Gary Sims, and this is Gary Explains. After 27 years, Linux is a very dominant operating system in the world today. And what I want to do is look at the history of these first 27 years to see where it all started and where we have arrived today. So if you want to find out more about the history of Linux, please let me explain. So let's just start with some caveats. Yes, there are lots of things I've missed out. There's obviously 27 years worth of history here, and I really have just chosen some highlights that I wanted to emphasize, but I would like to hear from you in the comments below if there are other things that you particularly found interesting over the last 27 years of uh, Linux history. Also, if you like the t-shirt, you can buy that online. There'll be a link in the uh, description below. And also, if you are interested in writing Android apps, do check out my Android Android uh, development course at digitacademy.com. Again, link in the description below. Okay, let's get started. So in 1991, Linus Torvilds posted uh, uh, an announcement that he's doing a free operating system. It's just a hobby, won't be big and professional, and it works on 386 and 486 computers. And at this point, he does note that it's free of any minutes code and that it has a multi-threaded file system, but it's not very portable because it only works on the 386. Now, if you want to understand the context of that announcement, including Minux and the history that brought us to hear about the Unix operating system, then you really should watch my Unix versus Linux uh, video, and there'll be a link also in the description below. So a few people started to work together with Linus on Linux, and by 1992, it was re-licensed under the GNU GPL, and interestingly, it has never moved over to GPL version 3, and there's a whole history about that that we won't get into just now. Now, in 1993, we see the development of the Slackware Linux distribution and the Debian Linux distribution. And of course, Debian is very much used today. And Slackware was how many people, including myself, first got into Linux. And I'm actually planning another video where I'm going to show you what it was like to run Slackware version 1 way back in 1993. So watch out for that video. By the time we get to 1994, Linus has uh, concluded that the components that make up the kernel are mature enough for it to be called version one. So we receive the release of version one of Linux. And at this point, it only works on uh, IBM compatible PCs with an Intel 386 or 486 processor. A year later, we now have Linux uh, version 1.2. And for the first time, it's actually been ported to other hardware, including the DEC Alpha. And I remember myself using Linux 1.2 on uh, deck alpha machines, on MIPS, and of course on SunSpark. For another year, and now we're up to 1996, and version two of the Linux kernel has been released. And the important thing about V2 is it includes SMP, symmetric multiprocessing support, which means you could have multiple processors. Now, way back then, the idea of a dual core and a quad core processor was certainly not common, but having motherboards with two physical processors in them was, was common. It wasn't mega common, but it was around. And the fact this could be supported means that Linux was now able to move more into the server area where this kind of technology was more readily available. So this is a big milestone for the development of Linux. Also in 1996, because version 2 was released, we see the development starts for version 2.1. And this actually establishes a pattern that sticks with us for several years. And that is that the 2.1 and 2.3 and 2.5 were always considered to be the unstable development kernels. And that actually what people should be using was 2, 2.2, 2.4 and 2.6 the versions that were stable. And when a development uh, tree was deemed enough to be stable enough, it was then renamed as the next uh, even number. So 2.1 became 2.2 and then development started on 2.3. So by the time 1999 comes around, 2.1 has been developed sufficiently that it can now be renamed as 2.2. And two of the big key items there were spin locks, were removed global spin locks. Of course, all global locks are bad when it comes to terms of performance and scaling. And there is frame buffer support for the console. But we also see for the first time, Linus passing over the mantle for maintaining older kernel versions to somebody else. And this particular person was, of course, Alan Cox, who was then responsible responsible for maintaining 2.2 so that any serious bug fixes could be made while development continued with 2.3. 
By the time we get to 2001, the Linux 2.4 kernel has been released. This includes USB support, Bluetooth support, and the EXT file system, which I'll talk about in a moment. We have the world's first ever Linux kernel developers summit. And of course, following the same model, version 2.5 development begins. Now, the interesting thing is that version 2.4.15 adds support for EXT3, which is a journal file system. Now, a journal file system actually keeps a log of things that have not yet been committed to the file system. And what this enables to mean is that if the, file si the system shuts down uh, uncleanly because of a power failure, for example, then when it reboots, it doesn't have to check the entire file system to make sure it's in a known state. It can do that very much quicker by looking at this log. So it makes the file system more reliable and actually it is able to recover from unclean shutdowns much more quickly. And journal file systems really today are the norm. Now, when you get to 2002, something interesting starts to happen. Although it's true that Linux can scale from one processor to two processor and so on and so on, Linus the man doesn't scale, there was only one of him. And up until this point, he was doing all the kernel development very much using a manual set of tools. He was applying patches and kind of compiling all from the command line and it worked, but it was a lot of hard work. And as the kernel grew, and as the number of contributors grew, and as its influence grew, he needed some tools to help him automate that process. And he chose to use BitKeeper. And we'll come back to BitKeeper and his choice for using that in a moment. In 2003, we had the release of Linux 2.6. And one of the big things about 2.6 was it included a new scheduler, which was guaranteed to always complete its algorithms in a fixed amount of time. So it didn't matter whether there were 10 processes running or a thousand processes running, it would always be able to work out what its next job was to do in terms of scheduling in a fixed amount of time. And the same was also true of the SMP scalability. It didn't matter how many cores or how many processors you added to a system, Linux didn't slow down because it had to do more and more work. And those were major achievements in terms of scalability for Linux. Now at this point, the idea that the odd number kernels, 2.1, 2.3 were development kernels, and the even numbers ones, 2.4, 2.6 were stable kernels, changes. And in fact, we actually end up with 2.6 kernels for the next eight years. So when we get to 2005, there start to appear some problems with the use of BitKeeper. The main problem was that BitKeeper was a proprietary piece of software, and some of the Linux community were trying to reverse engineer the protocols so they could understand how the whole system worked. Eventually, after uh, several different uh, problems, uh, Linus was forced to abandon BitKeeper, and the result of that was that he wrote Git. And of course, Git is used by uh, open source advocates, and in fact, even by enterprises, all over the world today. So Linus Torv is not only responsible for Linux, he's also responsible for Git. And in fact, he wrote it in several uh, months, not very long time to develop such a sophisticated system. And in fact, he was able to release uh, Linux 2.6.12 solely using Git, having moved away from BitKeeper. In 2006, we see the first kernel that offers long-term support. This is with an understanding that some uh, situations, some enterprises uh, don't want to upgrade the kernel uh, to new features all the time. They'd rather something that was stable that only had critical bug fixes in it, and that was 2.6.16. And then, of course, 2007, we have the release of Android. And at the heart of Android is the Linux kernel. In fact, Android Cupcake version 1.5, which was released in 2009, used Linux kernel 2.6.27. And today, uh, Android Pi, which is version 9, uses version 4.9.84 or newer. And of course, Google says that there are 2 billion monthly active Android devices in use around the world today. So there are 2 billion people using on a regular basis the Linux kernel inside their Android smartphones. Isn't that amazing? In 2008, we see uh, EXT4, which was basically a development of EXT3. And one of the big things about EXT4 is it can support much larger volumes and file size. In fact, it can support volumes up to one exabyte and file sizes up to 16 terabytes. In 2011, Linus released uh, version 3 of the kernel for no other reason other than the fact that he wanted to switch over to the new number. And he says, gone are the days of 2.6 point big number. 
Now it's just version three. And actually it was just an exercise in renaming. 2012, we see the support for uh, ARM's big dot little and support for the Intel i386 was removed. Of course, ARM big dot little is what we use in our Android smartphones where you might have, let's say today, four high performance cores and four high energy efficiency cores. And the kernel is able to switch between the cores depending on what it's doing to either offer performance or to offer greater battery saving. Also in 2012, of course, we see the launch of the Raspberry Pi and the Raspberry Pi's uh, official operating system, of course, Raspbian, which was based on Debian. And this, of course, is an ARM based uh, board, which uses both ARM v6, ARM v7 and ARM v8, with, of course, ARM v8 being the 64 bit uh, variant across all of their different products. And so all, what started with uh, the i386, the Intel 386, way back in uh, then, uh, now we see that ARM is really dominating the uh, Linux arena, particularly in smartphones and particularly in hobbyist markets like this with the Raspberry Pi. In 2015, we see the release of uh, Linux version 4, and the big ticket item here is live patching, so that you can add security patches without needing to actually reboot the server. Very important in the enterprise. In 2016, Linux turned 25 years old. And in 2017, Linux 4.12 was released and that added support for USB Type-C, including for Type-C power delivery. And now here we are in 2018, the latest kernel version at the time I'm making this video is 4.18. And the big ticket item there are of course are uh, mitigations to protect against the spectra vulnerabilities. There are now four of them and they are all the different patches are being rolled out into the kernel to make sure that's not a problem for, uh, from a security point of view. Okay, so there you have it, 27 years of Linux history, very briefly, but those are some of the highlights that I thought were important, and I really hope we see another 27 years of uh, Linux uh, going forward. So my name's Gary Sims, this is Gary Explained. I hope you liked this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. As I said, keen to hear from you in the comments below what your favorite milestones have been during this last 27 years. Also, please don't forget to subscribe and please do share this video on social media. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.